I'm here with David Brancaccio from uh, Marketplace uh, Radio, one of uh, the uh, premier uh, programs in the United States that deals with issues such as the Euro crisis. And uh, one of the things I want to ask you, uh, David, is um, how easy or how difficult is it to explain something like the Euro crisis over radio to an educated audience in the United States? It's true, we do have this great audience. They're clued in, they're following this stuff. They didn't just wake up this morning going, where is Europe? I don't have to say things like Greece, an important smaller country to the south of, uh, of Europe that has you know, the Parthenon. The, uh, that said, you have to make connections to the United States. You just have to. There's a lot competing for people's attention. You wake up in the morning, you worry about your job. You don't necessarily worry about a person from Greece's job. So what we do is we draw those connections. Uh, some of the easier ones are if the Eurozone goes bust, it could have profound effects on, for instance, the U.S. election. I mean, if, if Eurozone goes bust in July, August, September, uh, I think President Obama has a significant problem. Another thing that we try to do is talk about if there really, if really Europe fell into a further abyss, Call it a Lehman Brothers event, because our audience understands, wait a minute, I may not have had stock in Lehman Brothers, but the banking system froze up. And wait a minute, that meant I couldn't get a car loan, or that meant I couldn't finance my kids' college education. So you draw those connections, and we actually had you know, big meetings about this, how we're going to drive this story home. And at one point, I think it was our, yeah, it was our Washington editor, the wonderful John Dimsdale, who had a brilliant idea. So we send the host, Kai Rizdahl, to Athens, Georgia. We send him to <laughs> Athens, Georgia. <laughs> nice. And he does the show for a day or two from Athens. And uh, you know, some of that is connections to the Greek community in the United States, it's sort of an obvious story. But then much more subtle uh, connections that we have to draw. But you have to keep making the case. Yeah. I mean, I got a, an interesting lesson about this just the other day. The world's most boring story. I mean, guaranteed to make your eyes glaze over. It was almost comical in its nature, which was the uh, Chinese authorities had decided to change their exchange rate and let the renminbi, the yuan, trade in a wider band. I mean, look, your eyes are yeah, glazing I'm, over. I'm right? barely staying awake. Yeah, and what's about. the story about? This is about the ability for Americans to get hired to make things to sell more cheaply to China. Mm -hmm. This is about China's. Uh, with a, if the exchange rate floated higher, their products would become more expensive in the United States, and perhaps the U.S. would then have a more uh, competitive advantage. These are crucial, important things, but you still have to kind of connect the dots. Right. Does this lead, perhaps, to highlighting some features rather than others? Let me give you an example of this. Uh, from my point of view, two big stories linking Europe and the United States uh, are the following. Back in November, uh, people have money market accounts here, and they don't know what happens to the dollars when they put them in the bank. And it turned out that American banks were buying a lot of short-term European bank debt, which is probably about as safe as taking your savings, taking it around the back of the house and burning it. So that would be something that's immediately apparent, but it's very hard to explain the wholesale funding market for European banks. How do you frame something like that? How would you explain the wholesale funding market to someone? No, it's true, and I think you never can to my audience. I think uh, unless you did some sort of cool tutorial just about the wholesale funding market. But this is what you can do. Essentially, you've just pitched a great story. So I have to think it through. How do we connect it? There's a good way, because there's, um, there's a move in the United States to rethink the entire money market system. The money market system was seen as the same as cash going into the 2008 meltdown. You put a dollar into one of these things, you don't get much of interest rates, but at least you get a little bit of something, and you definitely get your money back. It's not gambling. Well, there is already an ongoing debate with some vivid voices in Washington saying, we have to rethink this. Mm -hmm. There was a couple moments in 2008 where it didn't look good. And uh, there's even an interesting move that everybody can understand where maybe you'd go on a website and take a look at your real-time readout from your money market fund. What do you mean it goes up or down? That would be a reminder. Oh, it's a little below a dollar. You put in a dollar, it's a little below today. Does that mean there is some risk? And then you open it out into, oh, and by the way, why are we talking about this? Why might there be risk? Well, guess what? Some of, this, some, some of the, uh, the foundation for, for this investment is over with our friends in Europe, who you may be seeing in these other headlines, are having a bad day. So there's ways to do it. Mm -hmm. But the overall challenge is this. 
I think all journalists, unless you're like a real specialist, is very often relying on uh, practitioners, people in the field, people who know more than you. I call you sometime, yeah. and you know more than me. I mean, it's just it's it's uh, it's so clear. Well, typically, who do you call? You call market players, market participants. They're the ones dealing with this hour by hour. They have fancy MBAs, and they're clearly smarter than me. I, I have a silly journalism degree. Um, and they frame the issue in the way they want to frame the issue, regardless of the question that you ask. And what, the way they frame the issue is, we want our money back from these co countries. And we don't want anything to get in the way of us getting our money back. And so most stories turn in that direction. It takes a little bit of brute force to think of it in a, more, uh, in a wider, more comprehensive way. Right. One last question. When you want to understand the story, you go to market participants, but you know that you're getting an angle. How do you figure out what's the angle and how do you figure out what's the story, particularly on something as complex as the Euro crisis? Yeah, it's true. I mean, one challenge, but also one benefit is a story like the Euro crisis unfolds over now a couple of years. So we have to come up with a new angle often, early and often. So we do turn to people uh, with expertise to sort of hear what's on their mind. And sometimes it's fraught because it's market participants. Sometimes it's academics. But ultimately, we have to tell stories. It cannot be a spreadsheet. It can't be a PowerPoint slide. It has to be a story involving a human being. Now, some of this high finance stuff gets, it gets pretty rarefied. And yet, it is still crucial. So that's the huge challenge. We're, there's a bias in my work against stories that don't have human beings at the base of it. But ultimately, we're talking about people's livelihoods. I mean, that is the only reason to spend any time on this. It's about people's livelihoods and people's sense of, uh, if not national security, uh, economic security. So I think ultimately we can do that if we're careful. But yeah, you need a new angle every hour and a half. So it does, it's actually an opportunity in the end to try to get this right.